Pasadena presents the annual Tournament of Roses, traditional Southern California New Year festival. Admiral William Halsey, Pacific War hero, leads the four-mile-long parade of 50 floats in the first great flower pageant since the beginning of the war. The tournament's queen rides past a record crowd of a million and a half spectators. Victory and peace are the keynotes of this year's pageant. San Francisco's float recalls its part in the framing of the United Nations Charter. For the first meeting of the United Nations Organization's General Assembly, the United States delegation boards the Queen Elizabeth, Edward Stettinius, Mrs. Franklin D. Roosevelt, and Senators Connolly and Vandenberg will represent the United States in opening the great and hopeful meeting for world peace. An American transport plane lands at Jiangwan Airfield at Shanghai, bringing the new United States ambassador to China, General George C. Marshall. War Minister Ho Ying Chin, the mayor of Shanghai, and United States General Wedemeyer extend official welcome. Throngs of enthusiastic Chinese crowd the sidewalks for a glimpse of the general's car as the party leaves the airport. From Shanghai, General Marshall flew to confer immediately with Chiang Kai-shek and communist leaders. The world looks forward to China's future peace and internal security. California port, a transport lies ready to take a group of Japanese war prisoners away from the United States. Most of them will go to Hawaii for reassignment to construction work in the devastated areas of the Pacific before ultimate return to Japan. They make the trip in vessels which will bring American soldiers back home. Hats over eyes, huddled in corners, these soldiers were taken prisoner in the island campaigns which led to Japan's final defeat. All prisoners of war held in America will have been returned by April. As the world faces the challenge of a new year, President Truman speaks to the American people. 1946 is our year of decision. This year, we lay the foundation of our economic structure, which will have to serve for generations. This year, we must decide whether or not we shall devote our strength to reaching the goal of full production and full employment. This year, we will have to make the decisions which will determine whether or not we gain that great future at home and abroad which we fought so valiantly to achieve. We cannot shirk leadership in the post-war world. The problems of our economy will not be solved by timid men mistrustful of each other. We cannot face 1946 in a spirit of drift and irresolution. The men and women who made this country great and kept it free were plain people with courage and faith. Let us justify this heritage. The Allied nations mourn the death of General George S. Patton, fiery commander of the famous United States Third Army, which swept all before it on the battlefields of Europe. Returning to the ancient duchy of Luxembourg, liberated a year ago by Patton's army en route to Germany, come the remains of the famous general who survived two wars only to die of injuries received in an automobile accident. His widow accompanies the casket as it is borne in an army vehicle through the silent streets of a grave and grateful city. The cortege, continuing to the nearby American cemetery, includes the general's horse, its saddle tied with crepe, and the general's boots reversed in the stirrups. Pallbearers, 
enlisted men of his various divisions escort Patton's casket to the graveside, where he will be committed to the company of his comrades with whom he fought so well. famous ships brings home one of America's most famous fighting units. The Queen Mary reaches New York with the fighting 82nd Airborne Division, home after two years of battle. <laughs> one soldier couldn't wait for the big ship to dock. He bet his comrades he'd be the first man ashore, and he had to get wet to win. triplets, three boys, were fellow passengers of the division. Infant sons of an American sergeant and his English wife, they were christened aboard ship with the entire division as godfathers. Their mother, Mrs. Robert Glass, who arrived to join her husband, is grateful to the 8,000 soldiers who contributed a substantial fund for the youngsters' education. same building in Manila, where General Yamashita was recently sentenced to hang, another leading Japanese general goes on trial for war crimes. In civilian clothes, General Masaharu Homa, commander of the Imperial Japanese Army in the Philippines during the war's first nine months, faces a five-man military commission headed by Major General Leo Donovan. Homa hears his arraignment. He is held responsible for the bombing of Manila after it had been declared an open city, for the shelling of Corregidor after United States General Wainwright had expressed his intention to surrender. Asked how he pleads, Homa answers in English, He not guilty. The guilt or innocence of Masaharu Homa will be decided by the commission after due trial. America's winter sports resorts are crowded as wartime travel restrictions are eased. In New Hampshire, the skiers take advantage of comfortable new ski toes. It's easy going up and thrilling sports speeding down the slopes. In memory of Torger Toko, America's leading pre-war ski jumper, a memorial meeting is held in New York State. Tokel, who was killed with the United States Army in Italy, won many competitions on this bare mountain jump. The winning jump today is made by Art Devlin, who leaps 148 feet, displaying perfect form. But all are not so lucky or skillful. Spill follows spill as the lesser lights try hard to follow in the master skier's ski tracks. At Lake Placid, New York, these speedy sportsmen shove off on the bobsled run for the first races held here since the war. 